Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Virtual Insights, Working Birds on Wildfowl Decoys and Conservation. Thank you so much for joining us in virtual community across time zones for this evening's conversation. Please note that English language closed captioning is available just by clicking the CC button located at the bottom of your screen. My name is Rachel Rosen. I'm Director of Learning and Engagement. And as we be begin today's program, I want to acknowledge that our museum stands upon Lenape Hoking, the unceded traditional homeland of the Lenape Delaware people. We honor Lenape people past, present, and future. And we, as a museum, are committed to advancing and centering Indigenous perspectives and histories through exhibitions and programming. So as many of you know, the museum is dedicated to uplifting the work of self-taught artists across time and place. And we are thrilled to celebrate our 60th anniversary with our two current exhibitions, Multitudes and Pushing Boundaries, 60 Years of AFAM Exhibitions, curated by my colleagues, Valerie Rousseau and Emily Gibbalt. These are now on view at 2 Lincoln Square through early September, and we really hope you can make it in to visit um, in person if you can. Uh, Multitudes is an incredible exhibit drawn from the museum's collection and features over 400 artworks. We are so grateful for opportunities like this to connect with each other online. Um, these are made possible by the National Endowment for the Humanities, and of course by you, our now global programming community. Thank you for donating to sustain ongoing virtual programs and our 60th milestone. So tonight's program, Inspired by Multitudes, is in partnership with New York City Audubon and explores the fascinating history of wildfowl decoys. It was designed for birders, naturalists, and folk art enthusiasts alike. Um, considered the, one of the oldest American art forms, Decoys were originally created by indigenous hunters to lure wild birds and are now used by nature photographers, scientists and conservationists to document and monitor endangered species. Recently digitized, the American Folk Art Museum's wildfowl decoy collection is one of the museum's earliest and most extensive holdings. So this program will both um, explore the impact of early conservation efforts on decoy design and use and New York City Audubon's ongoing advocacy for the protection of our wild birds and their habitats. Uh, we are excited that tonight's program brings together Caitlin Parkins, Interim Director of Conservation and Science at New York City Audubon, and Amy Lusty, recent project coordinator for the American Folk Art Museum's Wildfowl Decoy Project. Our speakers will reveal new findings from the recent collection survey and we'll discuss current conservation projects involving decoys locally. So uh, we will begin with introductions, uh, followed by presentations and then a discussion between our two speakers, uh, followed by a Q&A with you, our audience. Uh, we do invite you to share questions throughout the evening. You'll be using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And of course, we will make every effort to respond to um, as many of these questions as possible. So please note that this evening's program is being recorded um, and that recording will be made available to watch online later this week and also added to our YouTube and Vimeo channels. So we hope you enjoy revisiting uh, the talk and sharing tonight's program widely. Amy Lusty is an art historian, archivist and naturalist based out of Brooklyn, New York. Amy served as project coordinator for the wildfowl cataloging and digitizing project at the American Folk Art Museum from January through October of 2021. Amy currently provides support to grant funded projects at the Center for Brooklyn History and the National Audubon Society. Caitlin Parkins is an urban wildlife biologist with a background in conservation biology and animal behavior. Caitlin holds an MS in biology and an advanced certificate in conservation biology from Fordham University, where she studied NYC's urban bat population for her thesis. Caitlin is currently Interim Director of Conservation and Science at New York City Audubon, where she leads research programs focused on many aspects of urban bird conservation, um, which include bird migration and movement, 
bird window collisions, and beach nesting shorebird productivity. I thank you both so much for being with us. And at this point, I will turn it over to you, Amy. Uh, my name is Amy Lusty. I'm really excited to be here to share my work with the American Folk Art Museum and to be joined in conversation with Caitlin Parkins from NYC Audubon. Um, yeah, as Rachel said, I was on board uh, with the American Folk Art Museum as project coordinator last year from January to October. My role was to help coordinate the collection assessment, the cataloging and the digitization efforts of the Wildfell Decoy Collection, which is roughly 260 objects. Um, this project was funded by a grant from the Robert David Lyon Gardner Foundation. And this project combines my work as an art historian with my avocation as a birder. So it was really uh, such a fun project to work on. And I'll go into more detail about the project later, but first I wanna start talking about uh, with an introduction to decoys and their origins. So uh, decoys are representations of birds that are used to lure and attract wild birds down from the sky into a field, a shoreline, or into a body of water where a hunter, or where they'll be within a hunter's gunning range. Um, they are three-dimensional objects that are modeled to the scale of the species that they're representing. Uh, they can be primitive and simple in their design or really detailed renderings. And in these carvings, we'll see uh, various species represented native to North America. And as we'll hear from Caitlin later, uh, decoys are also used in conservation to lure birds into breeding areas. And they're also used by wildlife photographers to get birds closer to the camera. The earliest decoys in North America date back to approximately 400 BC. The practice of using birds to, or using decoys to lure birds in for hunting was invented by indigenous Americans. And these duck decoys were excavated from the Lovelock Cave in Nevada. And can anyone recognize what the species is? We'll leave some time. You can put your answers in the chat. Uh, the decoys on the left are made from native bulrushes, which are an aquatic and wetland sedge species. Uh, they're woven, twisted, and tied together and further embellished with feathers. And then on the right, we have another early decoy from the Northern Paiute people. Um, these bird skins and bills are stretched around forms made of rushes. On other continents, other methods of luring birds dominated, but we do see a few examples from ancient Greece, Egypt, and Australia. And the wooden carved decoys that we see proliferate and evolve in North America really originated from European settlers observing and hunting with indigenous North Americans. And then these practices eventually made their way back to Europe. So I forgot, I can't see the chat when I'm sharing my screen, but the answer for this bird is that this is the canvas back. Diaries and letters from colonists of the mid 17th and 18th centuries describe decoy practices of Native Americans. The colonists adopted these tools for their own use, uh, favoring carved blocks of woods as material. By the latter half of the 19th century, we see anecdotes about using decoys in hunting manuals and sporting publications. And at this time, during migration seasons, bird populations are described in such abundance that it's said a flock of geese could take a whole day to pass and that they would darken the face of the moon at night. At this time, the bird population seemed an inexhaustible resource to help supplement colonist food reserves. The 20th century illustrations above show how the waterfowl decoys are used. The illustration on the left uh, shows a scene of the ducks floating on the surface of the water set up in a rig um, with a hunter hiding on the shore in a blind or on a boat. There are three main types of wildfowl decoys. The first uh, represents waterfowl species like the black duck, mallards, pintails, shovelers, redheads, canvasbacks, mergansers, scoters, long-tailed ducks, uh, and geese. Uh, they're aptly named floaters because of, uh, as we saw in the previous illustration, they're designed to float in the water. And their form mirrors the bodies of the waterfowl they're depicting, however, they don't have feet. The bottoms are generally flat or rounded. Um, as we'll see in the next slides, and there'll be either a weight inset or kind of nailed to the end um, to, to act as a, a keel or a stabilizer for the form as it floats. And we'll see in like the upper right illustrate or the upper left illustration, they're attached to an anchor by the chest. Uh, they'll be float underwater so they don't float away. Um, these are installed on ponds, rivers, and out in the open ocean. And multiple species will be present to create a more realistic and natural scene. And hunters talk about trying to come to that perfect combination of species and placing them in the right formation to appear realistic and inviting. 
And all the decoys that you'll see in the rest of this presentation are in the collection of the American Folk Art Museum. Uh, as I'm moving through the slides, if there's any decoy you want to learn more about, I encourage you to write down either the carver's name, the bird name, or the accession number here. And uh, the collection is searchable by any of those terms. And I believe Rachel will put that collection in the chat. If not, I will after my presentation. The next type represent shorebirds. Um, they'll have holes carved in the bottom. They're installed on spikes in small flocks of various species along the shoreline. Uh, they're stuck into the sand, into the mud flats, or set up on rocks. And shorebird decoys include dowagers, sandpipers, sanderlings, godwits, yellowlegs, curlews, ready to turnstones, and a few species of plovers. Um, shorebird decoys exhibit both spring and fall plumage as they were originally hunted in both seasons as they pass along the Atlantic byway to and from breeding grounds. And you'll commonly see the shorebirds exhibiting different postures like running, feeding, and preening. Wildfowl hunting and the use of decoys exponentially multiplied in the late 19th century uh, with more accurate, inexpensive, and readily available rifles and ammunition being invented. Um, with this improved equipment and a high demand for food, this seemingly inexhaustible supply um, of the commercial hunting market proliferated. And these unsustainable practices resulted in the extermination of a few species like the Eskimo curlew, the passenger pigeon, and the Labrador duck. Uh, the Weeks-McLean Act of 1913 prohibited spring hunting and the marketing of migratory birds, um, also the importation of uh, bird feathers for women's fashion. Then the Migratory Bird Treaty Act in 1918 replaced that and offered additional protection to all native species during migration. Was shorebird hunting was outlawed two years after that. Uh, there was no use for shorebird decoys, so these were often burned for fuel or kind of discarded. Uh, shorebird carvings made after this time were solely decorative and not used in the field. And in mentioning this, I'm not talking down about hunting or hunters. Uh, early naturalists were synonymous with hunters. Hunters have a real appreciation for the natural life cycles, behaviors, and ecosystems of different species. And many conservation efforts were founded and funded solely by sport and recreational hunters. So it's really the unsustainable practices of the commercial market hunting to meet uh, a higher supply and demand that had these negative effects on bird populations. Slide's not moving, there we go. Uh, the third type of decoys are confidence decoys. And these are species that were once hunted as part of the fashion trade. Their feathers were often used in hats. And these can include gulls, swans, herons, and cranes. Um, after the Migratory Bird Treaty Act was passed, uh, prohibiting hunting of these species for the use in the fashion trade, these decoys were still used in rigs uh, to instill a sense of confidence for birds passing by. And again, it's about this combination of decoys, or a combination of species in a rig to make the scene look more natural and realistic. And these three just happen to be my favorite, some of my favorite three in the collection. Uh, the swan in the upper right was carved from the mast of a shipwreck. It was originally a Canada goose that was then repainted. And you can really see the roughness of the surface from having been used in the field and then repainted again over and over. Since these are functional tools, decoy construction and materials are informed by their use on the water and on shorelines. Many hunters carved decoys for their own use. Others traded for decoys. Some carvers even traded patterns. Uh, the handmade decoys could also be purchased from sporting stores and catalogs. Uh, the most common material is wood. Carvers uh, favored the wood of the Atlantic white cedar and the Eastern white pine. Um, aged wood was the best. The weathered wood kind of uh, mimicked textures of feathers. So shorebirds being smaller could be carved from a single block of wood, just a jackknife. Um, they could be made from scrap wood and even tree roots. And the delicate thin bills of the shorebirds were the most vulnerable part um, from wear, from weather, transport, and storage. So these were often made of stronger woods, nails, or bent metal. Cork is also a common material. Um, it was often sourced from life-saving preservers that washed ashore and could be remodeled into bird-like forms. I just want to point out here that the with waterfowl, we predominantly see male species in their spring plumage. Um, some carvers like Charles E. Shang Wheeler here would carve uh, male and female and often in different postures like sleeping. So the keel shown on the hen in the upper right uh, would have helped to stabilize the decoy in choppy ocean or bay waters. 
This design came about much later. Uh, you can see the date from this is 1950. Uh, these birds are canvas stretched around a frame. The hollow bodied birds were much later to transport. So aside from the museum registration labels on this, the bottom of this bird, uh, you'll also see the lead weight that would be attached with nails and uh, a leather loop that where it would be connected to an anchor underwater. And this presentation is not exhaustive of all the materials used. Factory decoys from the 1870s are made of molded tin. Um, other silhouette and profile decoys are also made of tin and cardboard even. Um, I'm not going to talk about those here, but uh, shorebird decoys were also made of paper mache held together by a waterproof adhesive. And we tend not to see those as much because they deteriorate faster than wood. Decoys typically have two layers of paint, um, an undercoat to seal the wood or the cork or the canvas, and a second coat to simulate easily recognizable field markings, and occasionally a third layer uh, with details. So some carvers worked their surfaces in great detail, creating textures that imitate feathers using techniques and tools such as combs and dry brushing. Uh, other makers favored a more simplistic approach, kind of generalizing field markings to large shapes that could draw birds in from a distance. And the heads received the most attention and they were usually carved from a separate piece of wood. The eyes were painted or carved in or uh, inset metal tacks or glass eyes used in taxidermy. This is another slide to illustrate the detailed surface treatments of different carvers, uh, particularly used in shorebirds. And here we see different types of brush strokes on the belly, the neck and the head and the back. Uh, with this slide, I also want to demonstrate and celebrate the high resolution photography uh, from AFAM's in-house photographer, Andrian, and kind of segue into the cataloging and digitization project at the American Folk Art Museum. In 2020, the museum received a grant from the Robert David Lyon Gardner Foundation. The goals of the project uh, were to enhance the catalog records, photograph the collection, consult specialists and make the collection accessible to a wider audience through an online catalog. So the museum holds 260 decoys in its collections over which half of them were donated in 1969 by Alistair Martin. And this is one of the museum's first and largest acquisitions. Uh, the decoys in the collections range from the 1860s through 1979. And the styles vary uh, from working decoys that show obvious signs of wear from being outdoors and more modern ornamental decoys and bird carvings. A majority of these decoys were early acquisitions. Um, many of the catalog records were incomplete or the information never made its way from the analog object records to the collections management system. So I went through all of the paper acquisition files from 60 years to reconcile the information with our current database. Uh, the collections team and I measured the decoys to account for all three dimensions and we determined a more detailed media for the works and kind of standardizing our language that we use for that. Um, little details like whether they had tack or glass eyes or if they had a weight or branding present on the bottom. So in this I also conducted research into the known carvers adding geographic regions, birth and death dates to give further context. And in updating these catalog records, I went through to replace the name of 14 objects to the preferred and updated name of the long-tailed duck. The historical name for this bird contained a derogatory racial and ethnic slur. Uh, the bird name was changed in the, early, uh, in the year 2000 by the American Ornithologist Union, and we wanted the catalog records to reflect this more inclusive and conscientious name. Over the course of seven months, we cleaned and photographed the decoys. We worked to replace older photography and slide scans with high resolution images. Uh, the decoys were photographed from multiple angles and the works uh, that had interesting brandings or weights on the bottom, those were also photographed. And the images were added to our collections management system that syncs to the online collection. A major part of this project was coordinating the collection assessment event, which invited uh, for decoy specialists to enhance the catalog records, helping to identify and confirm artists, dates, bird species, and geographic locations. Um, also any work that were of special uh, exhibition interest. The event was held in July, 2021. We worked with Bob Shaw, Tim Seeger, John Dieter, and Stephen O'Brien. Uh, 
and they each had a range of specialties and were extremely knowledgeable of the history, the construction of the carvers, and some of the folklore surrounding decoys. Um, we installed the entire collection in the self-taught genius gallery in Long Island City, which you can see here on the right. Uh, we moved through each object one by one, taking notes on new information. And then after the event, there was another round of uh, kind of data entry and research uh, to further enhance the catalog records. Together, we identified 34 carvers for works that were attributed uh, as artists unidentified and 15 new carvers not previously known to the collection. We revised the dates for 32 works that were originally attributed to solely a century or had no date. Uh, we added geographic regions for over 80 works that were missing those details. Um, the specialists identified 30 decoys from Long Island when our previous records uh, kind of only said we had three or four. So this collection assessment event provided insight into the collection, but we're hoping the online catalog and the exhibition will promote uh, further interest in ongoing interpretation of the objects. There's still work to do and still new information to be found out. The last step of the project grant was making the collection accessible. The catalog records were updated with this new information uh, from my research and from the collection assessment event and the new photography was assigned to those records. So now you can access uh, the digital catalog by visiting collection.folkartmuseum.org. And if you'd like to see these birds in person, around 30 of them are currently featured in the Multitudes exhibition at the American Folk Art Museum's Lincoln Center location that runs through September. And this installation represents shorebirds, waterfowl, and some of the collection's most prominent makers. And there's also a microsite for this exhibition that we'll put in the chat if you want to experience that show remotely. So that's, that's it. Thank you again for joining us. And thank you to the other folks at the museum that worked with me on this project. And that includes people from the collections department, the curatorial team, uh, the library and archives, development, IT, and education. And I want to end with this picture. Uh, this is a different type of decoy that we didn't really get to in this program. Uh, I just wanted to share this image to kind of illuminate the evolution of decoys and their uses and materials. Uh, we often see decoys separate from the environment they're installed in and removed from this original use as a tool. So especially seeing them on a shelf or in a gallery environment. So I wanted to bring you outside and illustrate the interaction between the living birds and these objects. And with that, I'll pass it over to Caitlin. Thank you so much, Amy. That was really, really interesting. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to participate in this presentation. Um, I talked about um, a lot of different topics for New York City Audubon, um, but this is actually the first time that I've had the opportunity to prevent, uh, present on this topic specifically. And it's kind of actually something that I've taken for granted in my career. So this has also been a great opportunity for me to sort of look into the history um, and the use of decoys and conservation. So hi everyone, my name is Caitlin Parkins. Um, I am the Interim Director of Conservation and Science at New York City Audubon. Um, New York City Audubon is a nonprofit conservation organization focused on protecting birds and their habitats in the five boroughs of New York City. Um, we do have that Audubon name and, and we are affiliated with the National Audubon Society, but we're a small independent nonprofit organization. Um, we have a, a staff of about eight right now um, and we work really hard on local conservation issues. So I implore you um, wherever you are to look up your local Audubon chapter and see what kind of good work they're doing. Um, so uh, we work to protect birds through advocacy, education, and conservation and science. Um, and I'm going to talk about a couple of our conservation programs today. Um, but first, I want to start uh, with the history of the use of decoys in conservation. And this is actually something that I've only really understood fairly recently. Um, I actually thought that this went back a little bit further than it does. Um, but the use of decoys for conservation really started in the 1970s. So Dr. Steve Kress was trying to work to bring puffins back to Maine, specifically to an island called Egg Rock. Puffins had been extirpated from Maine uh, in, I think, back in the 1800s um, from hunting. So they were overhunted. Um, but there were colonies remaining uh, to the north in, in Canada and Nova Scotia. 
And so one of the first things they did to try to bring puffins back to Maine was to take chicks from these colonies in Canada and bring them down to Egg Rock and hand raise them with the hopes that they would come back and colonize the island because they often they return to where they originally um, were hatched. And so they did that for several years and it didn't work. Um, the puffin chicks never came back. Um, and some people thought that maybe Dr. Kress should just give up um, and he wasn't willing to give up yet. So he says um, in interviews that I've, I've read with him, he says that he saw in National Geographic an article about puffin hunting in Iceland. And it gave him the idea that decoys could possibly be used to draw puffins in to egg rock to start a colony there. And so he contacted a board member who carved decoys, had some puffin decoys made, put them on egg rock, and it actually worked. Um, puffins returned to Eastern Egg Rock in 1997. Um, now there are almost, uh, I think, 200 pairs of puffins nesting in this colony. Um, the reason this works is through a concept called social attraction, especially with birds such as seabirds. Um, so if we think of uh, terns and mirrors and puffins and so all of these seabirds they tend to nest in colonies so they like um there's i could get really into the theories of why these birds nest in colonies but essentially um some of the theories include that they have protection from predators in the colony um safety in numbers if you will and also that they synchronize their hatching so that if a predator does come into the colony and eat some of the chicks, there will be more chicks than a predator can possibly eat. And there are some other possibilities as well and some trade-offs for nesting in a colony. So essentially puffins nest in colonies and if a colony starts fairly small, more puffins will be attracted in. And this is why decoys work. Placing decoys somewhere that you want birds to nest can attract them to the area and get the convince them to start nesting. Um, and I pulled some examples uh, that are actually, um, you know, there are, there are examples of, of decoys being used uh, to establish nesting colonies all over the world, but I just picked four that I found. Um, the Royal Turn uh, decoys have been, that's the top left over here, decoys have been used to establish Royal Turn nesting colonies on dredge islands off of North Carolina. The common mirror, which is on the top uh, right, I love those decoys. I love those birds in general, but I love the, the decoys that look like they're standing up and alert. Um, outside of San Francisco, there was an oil spill in 1986, which devastated common mirror populations and decoys were used to reestablish those colonies. The Lazen albatross down in the bottom left corner, um, those birds were trying to breed in Oahu in areas that were not great. They were getting predated by dogs and cats, um, and so uh, decoys were used elsewhere to try to attract the colony to a safer, ne safer nesting area. And on the right, this is the short-tailed albatross. Um, and these birds, um, there's a, an institute uh, in Japan, um, the Yamashina Institute for Ornithology, and they are trying to establish short-tailed albatross colonies on an island chain in Japan. So to bring it a little bit closer to home again, um, a lot of the work that New York City Audubon does, uh, or one of our core programs is on the water birds of the New York Harbor. Um, these birds, water birds, when I say that word, I, I mean everything that sort of lives in around and depends on the, on the water. Um, and so these include our herons and our egrets, the oyster catcher um, in the second photo and its chick, birds like the common tern um, and the black skimmer these three on the right are all beach nesting birds. And you might think that, you know, New York City isn't necessarily a great place for water birds. And that can be true. It's really tricky for these birds to breed and raise young um, in tandem with all of the people who live in New York City. But we have miles and miles of shoreline, of marsh islands, um, of habitat for these birds, especially concentrated around Jamaica Bay. Um, over here, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, um, around the edges of Staten Island, and of course, north up and towards the Long Island Sound on islands up there. 
Um, and so we work to protect these birds and to protect their habitats in the city. Um, this is an example of one of our nesting islands. Um, this is a cormorant colony um, on a, a, an uninhabited island off of Staten Island. So how do we use decoys to do some of this work? I'll start with an example um, that anyone can actually go out uh, if you're in New York City and, and go see for yourself. These are the common terns. They nest on Governor's Island. So the common tern is this bird over here in the picture on the right with really pointy bills. Um, these birds are ground nesters as many seabirds are. They kind of make just like a little tiny scrape, like they push some petals together pebbles together and just lay their eggs. You can actually see down here that there is an egg down here. It's just like sitting on the pavement. They aren't necessarily great at making nests, um, but this is, this is um, where uh, the kind of habitat um, in which they like to nest. Traditionally, they nest somewhere like beaches, but of course, a lot of our beaches are not available or safe nesting habitat. And so um, years ago, we realized that terns were taking up nesting on some of the piers on Governor's Island. And some of those piers are safer and more ideal for the terns to use than others. And so in order to attract the terns to the pier, we put oyster shells out on, uh, the, on the pier. We also put some barriers up um, and we put turn decoys out. Um, and these decoys uh, sat out here and were paired with audio recordings of terns. Um, these are also some chick shelters that we put out, these little green boxes that provide shade for the chicks once they hatch. And lo and behold, the terns came to nest. This is uh, our former director of conservation science, Susan Elbin, with a tern on her head because she was being dive bombed. Here's another really good example of what a tern nest looks like on the ground. And just to give you a little taste of what it's like to be in a seabird colony and maybe understand why these birds nest in colonies, um, this is a video clip I had walked into the colony in order to do a nest count. And I put my phone up on my forehead like this and recorded, and this is what it was like. So these birds are aggressive, <laughs> they're mean, um, they will hit you in the head. Um, I've actually uh, had one of them draw blood before. Um, I had just like two little poke holes in the back of my head where it hit me with its bill, um, which is fair, I was in the colony. Um, but so we were able to attract terns to nest on, um, on this pier, in this colony, in this area that is safer for them by using decoys. One more. Another species that we use decoys for is the black skimmer. And we use this in a similar way to attract black skimmers to um, a specific location in hopes of starting a colony there. Black skimmers are actually not doing very well in New York State. Um, they used to have a number of colonies throughout the state on beaches all over Long Island, including beaches in New York City. Over the years, the skimmers have started consolidating essentially into just one or two large colonies out on Long Island. Um, and the problem with that is that you literally um, are putting all of your eggs in one basket. So if all of the skimmers in the state are in one place at one time, something like a storm or a predator could wipe out all of the black skimmers in the state all at one time. And so our goal is to have the skimmers kind of spread out and have uh, a number of colonies across the state. These are photos provided by a colleague of mine who works for the uh, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, he works on skimmer projects in uh, New York State and decided that he was going to make his own skimmer decoys. Um, and this is the process of making the decoy. Um, so he first sculpted the skimmer out of clay. Um, the, the bill and the body of the skimmer is actually kept separate. He made a mold um, of the skimmer and then puts um, epoxy resin inside uh, of the mold, puts it together, pops it out. Here are um, sort of the, the, um, the start of the decoys, I guess, um, before they're painted. 
And here they are all painted. I love this picture of them just like sitting in an office <laughs> um, and they're really beautifully painted. And then this picture, it's a little hard to see, but this is a group of scientists placing these skimmers out on the beaches in hopes of attracting real skimmers uh, to the beaches to nest there. They actually specifically place the skimmers in a particular posture where one is on a nest or um, what, you know, a fake nest. Um, facing one direction and the other one is alert and facing the other direction as if it's being um you know on the lookout for predators that those poses indicate that nesting has occurred and potentially might be more likely to attract in real live skimmers and then um, another thing we do, not just attracting birds to specific locations, but we study these birds and their movements. Um, these are all the species or some of the species that we banned, including the great egret. Um, and this is a herring gull chick. These birds are pretty easy to catch because we catch them when they can't fly. So we can just walk over and pick them up. Um, the bird on the top, this is actually one of the common terns from the tern colony on Governor's Island. And this down here is an adult herring gull. These two birds we were able to catch um, by putting traps over top of the nest. So the birds are caught when they return to the nest. And then up here in the top right is the semi-palmated sandpiper. And those we catch in mist nets that we string out at the beach. So the birds are just foraging, migrating through, and they fly into the nets. So all of these birds are relatively easy to catch, um, but there's one bird that's a little more difficult, and that's the American oyster catcher. These birds breed on the beaches of New York City. You can see them out in the Rockaways and at Breezy Point. Um, these birds are very long lived. We banned them with two orange bands with specific codes on, on both legs. And we've actually had some of these birds banded for about a decade now, and we're able to follow them from year to year, track their movements, see how many chicks they have. Um, so it's really helpful for us to be able to band and actually get to know these individuals. But <laughs> They're very difficult to catch. Um, you don't want to put a trap on their nest um, because you know they might not come back to the nest. Um, and of course they can fly, so you can't run up and grab them. And so we use decoys to attract these birds into a trap. It's actually like a very um, you know, wily coyote roadrunner type situation. So um, here is my colleague Emilio and two field assistants setting up the trap. Um, essentially, it is a net that is rolled up here at the bottom and there's a string attached to it. I'm telling you like very wily coyote stuff here. And we go maybe 50 meters away with this string. And when the oyster catcher walks under the net, we pull the string and the net springs over top of uh, the oyster catcher uh, and traps it to the ground. And then you can go remove the bird from the net. Now, these birds are not going to come anywhere near this trap if they don't have to. They know that it's something weird. They're definitely going to avoid it. And the way we attract them in is because they are very territorial birds. Once they form pairs, they make territories and they are very aggressive to anyone or any other oyster catcher that comes into their territory. And so we set up the net in their territory. It's actually called a whoosh net. Um, and we put two decoys in the territory along with a speaker to play sounds and in theory, the birds will get frustrated and annoyed with these intruders and fly to attack them, at which point we pull the net and catch the bird. And I have to say, you know, this bird looks a lot like this bird here on the bottom. Um, and this actually does work quite well. So here's a picture on the left of uh, an adult oyster catcher walking up and checking out the decoy. We actually had a bird go up and try to copulate with the decoy one time. Um, and then over here on the right, you can see um, we've just uh, pulled the string. The net is about to fly over this oyster catcher. This oyster catcher has clearly realized that he or she has made a grave, grave error um, and is about to be caught under this net. And so with that, um, I want to say thank you very much. I'm very happy uh, to answer any of your questions following the conversation. So please do put them in the chat. Um, and that's it for me for now. Thank you both so much. Um, that was an incredibly fascinating, generous, um, each of your talks just bringing so much in um, into our understanding of this historic art form and 21st century.
applications um, of decoys. So I will just take a moment to invite everyone to add your questions um, into the Q&A. I see there's some discussion in the chat, but be sure to add them to the Q&A. We'll circle back in about 30 minutes after your conversation and try to answer those questions. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. All right. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Caitlin. That was awesome. <laughs> thanks, Amy. Um, so, Amy, uh, I was looking at your presentation, um, and I've actually, you know, actually gone and viewed the pres uh, the uh, the collection um, at the Folk Art Museum. And some of the decoys look really different than others. Some seem to be really intricate. Some seem to be in not as good shape. I'm curious if all the decoys in the collection are actually used for hunting, or if decoys, you know, some of them were used for other things as well. Great observation. And I do have kind of some kind of a visual reference. I'm going to share my screen again. And we've selected some works from the exhibition to kind of talk about. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, not all of the decoys in the exhibition or in the collection um, were used for hunting. So when I would say in my presentation, kind of a working bird, um, it's also called a gunning decoy. These were what were made for hunting. So they were made to be out in the field. They're made to be shot over, they might be stockier, um, have a heavier construction. Um, and then there are also decorative bird carvings that came out a little bit later. Uh, so these two in the slide here, these are decorative bird carvings that would have been made for competitions or for collecting. Um, with the way to kind of tell the difference with gunning decoys, the birds, um, they'll usually have some sort of evidence of being in the field. So that's whether they have like this hook at the chest where it would be connected to an anchor or they'll be uh, a weight or evidence of weight, but often the weights were made out of lead. So they would be, you know, melted down and repurposed for other things like fishing lures. Um, you'll also see chipped paint and kind of shot holes because they were, you know, shot over. Uh, and then with competition grade birds, like the two here, the carver wasn't planning on hunting over them. So the, they take more time and put more detail into the carving and the surface treatment. So you can see kind of a close up here and carvers would share their works at trade fairs and hunting expos. And that kind of started, um, I wanna say in the late 1900s or late 1800s um, and then continues still to the present day. Um, so some carvers were uh, working bird, making birds uh, for their own hunting use, but while others kind of explored both sides of this craft. How, did you see like certain species being used for decorative objects versus actual working birds or um, was it kind of across the board? It was kind of across the board since like the collection I was working with was 260. Uh, it's kind of a small sampling of all the decoys that are out there. Um, other museums have uh, larger collections like the Shelburne. So it might be interesting to kind of to compare and see what, what the trends are for the species there. But things, I did mention this in my presentation, but the Migratory Bird Act of 1918, kind of you'll see certain species transition that are more commonly used in hunting decoys, like shorebird species weren't used after that date. So if you see a, a shorebird decoy, it was probably from before then, but if it's after then, it was solely for decorative and not for use. Are there, I guess it's kind of the same question as I like, I don't know how much work you did looking into like modern decoys. I, I, so I own a decoy as art <laughs> myself and it's a semi-palmated sandpiper. Um, and I know that when I went in, I went in and there were like every bird. It took me, I had to go back to the store three times to decide which bird I wanted to buy. Um, but I'm curious if there's like certain species like in modern decoys that tend to be art. Um, I mean, yeah, versus working birds. I have no idea. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah well, no. I'm thinking um, my my father and brother are hunters. And so the decoys that they have are large plastic Canada geese. And I imagine like Canada geese art, goose art decoys like might not be as common as some of the other species, but maybe that's just my bias, bias against Canada goose. <laughs> I think there are definitely yeah some Canada geese that are that are decorative and the, the Folk Art Museum does have some in their collection but they're they're not in the current multitudes show so if you want to check out the collection online you'll see some examples there. 
And I have some questions for you. Um, I kind of talked about uh, preservation in my presentation a little bit and uh, just curious of like what materials are the decoys made from that you're working with and kind of what are the condition of them after a season out in the field? Yeah, so the, the black skimmer decoys that I showed, those are epoxy. Um, and I don't work specifically with those decoys, but according to, um, you know, my colleague, they actually hold up quite well. Our other um, decoys uh, that we work with are polyethylene. And I kind of looked into some of the large conservation decoy manufacturers, and it seems like they tend to use either polyethylene in like a rotational mold. Um, so it ends up with a hollow bird, and that's for some of the larger species, or injection molded polyethylene um, for some of the smaller species. So those are actually solid decoys. Um, but ours, they hold up relatively well. Um, our oyster catchers have never broken or had to be touched up because we're taking them and we're putting them out. We're catching birds, we're bringing them back with us. At the end of the day, they actually have um, like a soft pillowcase that we wrap them and keep them in. Um, but our turn decoys sit out for almost the entirety of the season. And so they have a tendency to get blown over or to break if we don't do a good enough job of setting them up. And um, the piece that breaks most often is the, the bill. Um, so the bills just like break and fall off. And so far I've been able to reattach the bills if I can find them with just super gluing them back together. Um, we don't have a big budget. We don't have a ton of money to buy new decoys. So we try our best to keep them in good shape. Um, they also, the paint chips, um, they definitely get worn down for the wet, from the weather, even though they're made to be fairly durable. But one thing I found when I was looking into the use of decoys was that some of these big seabird projects who um, you know, are potentially working with hundreds of decoys on these islands, especially out west, have programs where um, they have educational programs where kids come in to help repaint the decoys after every season, which I think is really cool. And I, if we had more decoys that we use, I would love to do something um, like that. I think it could be a really fun way to engage kids in conservation um, in a hands-on way. I want to do that as an adult. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds really fun. Yeah. And I mean, I guess same back at you, like what was the condition of some of the, the working decoys and like, were there, ev was there evidence of repairs? Um, were there like different materials used on different birds for repairs? I'm curious. Yeah, they're in various states um, as a lot of them are earlier acquisitions um, and many of them were uh, working and gunning decoys. So they'd spent their time out in the field. Um, the common issues are kind of similar to the conservation decoys like chipping paint. Um, but in this case, we do have shot holes. Uh, there's missing or chipped beaks. So I'd say yeah, the, the missing or broken bills was pretty common um, and splitting wood. So if the wood wasn't seasoned long enough before the carver carved it, um, or seasoned or sealed properly, it might split along the grain um, as it ages and expands and also from being uh, exposed to water. Um, and they're really roughly handled. They were carried out in the field. Uh, shorebirds were carried kind of in bundles or like with a string around their neck and just kind of like slung over the shoulder. And then waterfowl were carried in boats. And a lot of times they would be um, like the only cushioning would just be like fishing nets under them. Um, and we see there are some evidence of repairs, uh, but I don't really know how to tell it. Uh, a lot of the specials would come in and they would say, oh, that one is repainted. And, you know, you'd kind of have to look at it for a while until you until you saw what they saw. But a few. So when uh, when collectors kind of go to auction or when museums acquire new pieces, they'll often X-ray the decoys. And uh, one of the specialists said that they take it to their local vet because it's like this, the same size as a as an animal as a pet. Um, and then from that, you can kind of see different construction types. So where like in this slide, like this, where the head is attached to the body, um, you'll be able to see if there was a repair done because there'll be kind of like a, new nails or new nail holes. Um, and the same goes for the bills. Yeah. 
So my next question for you is um, when you're using decoys for social attraction, uh, are your setups, are you use, pairing them with anything like audio to, to help further attract the birds? Yeah, we do use audio for both the oyster catcher and the common turn work. Um, you could hear in that video, common turns are really noisy and loud. Um, and studies show that audio cues tend to um, be really important to be paired with decoys. So I went through, there's a lot of very specific literature on specific species of birds and different decoy setups and what works and what doesn't. Um, and so uh, audio seems to be pretty important. I read a couple of studies. So um, we, I got my recordings that I use for our common turn colony from a, a common turn biologist. Um, and so I was provided with that and I kind of took it for granted that this is what works and it works for us. Um, the oyster catcher calls are a, uh, the alarm call. And so um, essentially oyster catchers make a really distinctive sound, which I wish I, I should have put it in the, in the presentation. Um, when they are angry about something, it's their alarm call. Um, and so when they hear an alarm call from another bird in their territory, they're gonna come in hot um, with their own call and try to, try to take out the, uh, the interlopers. Um, but I read some studies that showed that even specific types of calls from a particular bird um, could be more or less effective at attracting um, birds in, in the, the social attraction context. I also have read about a couple of other things that have been paired with decoys. Um, often, they also pair them with mirrors. So um, birds will fly in, birds aren't, well, this is maybe, birds aren't stupid. Um, they generally recognize that these decoys aren't real once they get in close. Um, it's not like they think the decoy is a real bird. Although I will say that one oyster catcher tried to copulate with the decoy. So maybe that specific bird just wasn't the brightest bird. Um, but they also sometimes include mirrors. So I wasn't able to find a picture of this that um, was like open source that I could include in this presentation, but I recommend looking up the use of mirrors uh, in Maine in the puffin colonies. There's some really cute pictures of like puffins interacting with mirrors. So essentially they're lured in by the sounds, by the decoys, um, but the mirror will give them sort of a more interactive experience because though they might recognize the decoy as not a real bird, um, for the most part, birds don't recognize themselves in a mirror. You might see this um, if you've ever had, say, a cardinal um, territorially attacking your car mirror or um, a glass door. So birds see their, a reflection of themselves and they think it's another bird. And so uh, the puffins would come in and sort of interact with the puffin in the mirror and it made it seem more realistic. Another thing that we've seen paired um, and has been effective is for burrowing seabirds, they actually construct the burrows. Um, and so they pair the decoys with the burrows that the birds nest in. And that seems to be more effective as well. And there is so much literature on what is and isn't effective. I didn't have time to read it all. I was trying to like compile everything. And I was like, in this case, this works. And in this case, it didn't work. And so um, for a biologist, depending on the species that you're working with, you really have to go and read the studies and also see what works in your specific context um, because it does seem a little bit context dependent. Uh, um, I'm, I'm, I actually don't know that much about hunting decoys. Do they pair, uh, do they use, uh, I mean, I guess they, uh, duck calls and sounds have historically always been paired with decoys for hunting, right? Yes, uh, I didn't read any studies, but I did read a lot of hunters anecdotes. Um, and in uh, William Mackey has a book uh, about decoys and he kind of mentions, it's one of the only mentions of, uh, about shorebird hunters using calls of, for plovers and yellow legs to bring down flocks. But there's more references alluding to using calls for waterfowl, um, primarily ducks and geese, um, because those practices are really still used today. Um, and originally we saw duck calls kind of made of reeds uh, that were blown through or blown against. Um, and a hunter would kind of master different calls, trying them out in the field and seeing what worked. 
Um, but if you weren't good at it, you would scare the birds away. So you had to practice at discretion and kind of, you know, practice at home first before being out in the field. And yeah, in modern day, there's, you can buy duck calls from hunting supply stores. Uh, they're made of carved wood or plastic or like an epoxy um, that you blow into, but you still have to kind of know different patterns. You can't, you don't just blow into it. You, got, you have to mimic it with your mouth. Um, and then turkey hunters have uh, really specific tools and it uses like friction. So it's either a, a piece of like wood uh, rubbed on a slate and then they have these like hollow wooden boxes calls. Um, and they're also, yeah, now digital call boxes, uh, you know, where you can have anything from a, a turkey to a deer. So that's another, that's another option. Cool. It seems like it's um, like an art form in itself, uh, you know, knowing the calls and, and which to use and when and how. Absolutely. I also realized, Amy, um, we put the wimbrel here, or uh, yeah, here in, in this, uh, the curlew. And um, I was trying to figure out in my research if like those sorts of birds, if decoys were used for them. And it does sound like they're used in the, um, the territorial like banding study way that we use American oyster catchers. Um, and I found that um, one of the manufacturers of decoys, um, and I was looking at our American oyster catcher decoy, and I, I actually don't know where we obtained it, but one of the most common um, manufacturers of American oyster catcher decoys actually just took um, their curlew decoy and like changed the beak on it to be different. And so they're very similar. And it seems so like the shape of the bird is similar enough. And as long as it's painted in the right color, it, it kind of still works. And with, uh, with seabirds and shorebirds that you're working with, are they only attracted to decoys of the same species? Um, so what I, for the most part, what I've seen, I was trying to figure this out and the answer isn't entirely clear, but it seems like if you want to target a specific species, you should use the, a decoy specifically made for that species that's the right size and the right color pattern. There are nesting colonies and birds that, that nest in mixed colonies. So sometimes once you bring in one species of bird, you'll end up with two or three or four more coming in afterwards and they form these mixed flock colonies. One example is out on the rockaways, you'll have common and least terns nesting together. But if you're looking specifically to attract least terns to create a colony, um, you should use specifically least turn decoys. They tend to be most effective. Um, you can probably speak a little bit better to the hunting side of things, but in my little bit of research that I was able to do, it seems like hunters like get really specific about it and try to make like very specific mixed flocks um, and are very like, yeah, try to sort of look at ducks and how they naturally come together. Is that what you found as well? Yeah, and again, I was kind of looking at like historic hunting practices from the, the late 1800s and early 1900s. So I can't speak to hunters today, but uh, yeah, you did see that hunters, you know, would use these kind of mixed flocks and they would share or they would not share, you know, keep it secret, kind of their combination of different species and usually with the waterfowl and the shorebirds. But with shorebirds like the black-bellied plover, that's uh, these two decoys here, they were only attracted to black-bellied plovers. So you had to you know, make sure you at least had one of those in your setup if you wanted that as a species to, to be attracted to. Yeah, I was looking at some modern hunting message boards last week, um, somewhere I didn't think I would ever end up, but it was really interesting. Um, but some were saying that uh, even when duck hunting, they still just use goose decoys because geese will draw in ducks, but that duck decoys won't draw in geese. And so, um, and then there was another whole conversation about how um, you can use mallards and sometimes teals will come in a, to a mallard flock, but pintails really like to stay by themselves. So for pintails, you kind of want to um, use that species specifically. So it seems, again, like its own art form, really. Absolutely. And I really love that, you know, they, 
hunters would kind of share this in different manuals and sporting publications, uh, as they would also with, you know, sharing their uh, decoy patterns. So it's a really, a really social practice. Um, I don't know if we, um, it, you talked a little bit about the different types of decoys, and I don't know if we're going to get into this, but um, for, what's the name the, of the type of decoy on the left, specifically? Like flatty. That's a flatty. Yeah, okay. that's a flatty. So yeah, they uh, there are some different terms. Uh, there's also silhouette, uh, which is kind of uh, larger flat, mostly you see Canada geese uh, portrayed as silhouettes. Um, but yeah, so this is probably only like an inch or less piece thick of wood. Uh, it was, you know, faster to carve. It was easier to kind of to kind of pump these out. So these are by the same carver, um, and he would have taken a lot more time on the one on the right. Oh, uh, you'll see these kind of like incised wingtips. Um, and then this was kind of like one he did also produce uh, for stores. So that's probably one that he made for a store on the left. Yeah, I was looking. Um, so we use entirely 3D um, decoys. We, we haven't used um, flatties or anything like that. And I was looking into the research. So there have been some scientific publications on which type of decoys work best. Um, and it seems that 3D decoys um, tend to work better. Um, and there are also a couple of different types of decoys that are sort of just like um, sort of plastic bags that are like somewhat shaped like the birds. Um, and one's called like Texas rags uh, is another term that I looked up. Um, and so in the scientific literature, at least it seems like, you know, a solid painted 3D bird is the most effective decoy. And it seems for most conservation work that that's specifically the kind that they use, um, but they're not cheap. And so I think uh, it makes sense that, that it's worth trying. Um, just as an aside, one of the studies I read, they used plastic flamingos for water birds and found that they were actually more effective than the Texas rag decoy, which I found very wow. interesting. And that they weren't trying. Yeah, they weren't trying to attract flamingos. They were um, attracting other waders, uh, but the flamingo was still kind of the right shape and size, I guess, for the bird to recognize. Just spray paint it white, like a <laughs> egret or something. <laughs> That's funny. It's a cheap way to do it, I imagine, um, if, if you were trying to, to attract in these waders. And that's all my questions for you. I wanted to share this last slide um, and kind of yeah ask you about some resources of where if folks want to learn more about conservation decoys, where can they start? Can you see the slide? Yeah. All right. So. I think that puts us into the Q&A portion. Wonderful. Um, thank you both. Um, that clearly there's a lot of activity both in the chat and Q&A, very illuminating conversation, um, questions that really go in all different directions. So we'll try to get to most of these. Um, I think this has been such a great introduction to the work of New York City Audubon. Um, and to the, the museum's digitizing uh, project. And so um, I think there are questions for, for each of you. Maybe we will start, um, this one is for Amy. Um, which one or two of the decoys in the museum's collection surprised you most, either in terms of species or carving um, when the assessment digitization project Great question. Uh, we were all really excited about myself, uh, the collections team and the collection specialists about the gull decoy. We have one gull decoy and one loon decoy. So those are both particularly rare because they weren't hunted uh, for meat. They were primarily hunted as part of the, the plumage trade. Uh, so you don't, you don't see those too often. And the loon that we have in our collection is uh, in spring plumage, which is different too, because usually Painters will have this uh, very, you know, high contrast, very showy 
uh, fall plumage or breeding plumage uh, for the, no, it wasn't, I don't remember, uh, but you can see in the collection, if you search loon. And uh, so we were really excited about those. And I think it was so incredible that um, throughout the course of the digitization project, you know, you mentioned how many new discoveries, um, how many times you were able to take the object information to from artists unidentified to, you know, illuminating more of, of what was known. Um, and I wonder, you know, you mentioned um, there's a lot more work to do in terms of uh, decoy collections and um, updating information. Can you can you speak to what that work might look like? Sure. So uh, since I'm now on, you know, on staff at the American Folk Art Museum, this is kind of passed off to curatorial staff now who has done additional research for the Multitudes exhibition, um, just in creating the labels and the microsite. So after uh, this kind of first round of catalog records was published online, um, some more decoy specialists have kind of gotten in touch to, to update with, with new findings. Um, and for each of you, if you're if you're noticing any questions that stand out to you that you really want to um, call up, please do. Um, but there is a question about ethical issues involved when it comes to decoys for hunting. So um, how vigilant are environmental organizations in monitoring uh, when bird species are being hunted too much and the use of decoys to lure them? Yeah, um, I can't. I mean. Um... The, uh, the ethical issues question, I think, is a difficult one to answer because everyone has their own opinions of what they consider ethical when it comes to hunting. I will say that the um, hunting is very highly regulated by both the federal government, depending on the species, and state governments. So the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation um, you know, it, they set bag limits for these birds, they monitor the populations um, and change the um, number of, of the amount of take is essentially what it's called, um, or the bag limit, if you will, um, depending on how the populations of these birds are doing. Um, we don't necessarily do a lot of monitoring of game bird species. We do monitor wintering ducks, we do participate in counts, um, but for the most part, especially in New York state, but also in other states, um, the governments really do have quite a good handle on hunting. Um, and like Amy said earlier in the presentation, um, hunters are some of the best conservationists around um, and they are, very much engaged with conservation work and protecting the species that they hunt. So for the most part, obviously there are bad actors in any group of people who maybe aren't as ethical, but for the most part, hunters want to be able to keep hunting. They want these species to keep um, existing. And so they're very much uh, engaged with species protection as well. And a few other species specific um, questions. So generally how, uh, Caitlin, how are shorebird populations doing in the city compared to nationally? Um, that's a great question. Um, so when we think about shorebirds, I, I think of a bunch of different species all at once. Um, our beach nesting shorebirds in New York City are not necessarily doing right now. Um, at many of the sites where beach nesting shorebirds are productivity, which is the number of chicks that fledge or, or actually grow up and start flying um, per adult. So it's um, per pair. And that number is down quite a bit for a lot of our species, for our common terns, our least terns, our American oyster catchers, and our piping clovers. Sharing beaches with as many people as New York City has is really hard for these birds. Human disturbance, um, off-leash dogs on beaches, feral and free-roaming cats out on beaches, um, other predators that are at higher populations because humans allow them to be, such as raccoons. All of these things can have devastating effects on beach nesting birds. Um, and so, yeah, our populations aren't doing very well right now. We're working on a couple of different studies uh, to learn more about why that might be the case, including using trail cameras to monitor nests and determine what the cause of nest loss is. 
for these beach nesting birds. Um, so we're working on it. And that of course is in collaboration with the land managers and other agencies such as New York City Parks and the National Park Service who actually own and, and manage the lands that these birds nest on. Some things that you folks can do in order to help. Um, if you go to the beach in New York City, you'll often see string fencing. Um, so it's called symbolic fencing. It's not gonna keep anyone out. It's just kind of a string barrier to show you where not to go, as well as signage that says, you know, please share the shore with nesting birds. Um, so the main thing you can do is keep out of those areas, give these birds a lot of space to raise their young, always um, either leave your pets at home or at least have your dog on a leash when you're at the beach. Um, dogs can be a really uh, big issue for birds uh, on beaches. So all of those things can help help our birds. And of course, you can learn more um, on our website at NewYorkCityAudubon.org. Um, the other suite of birds that I think of when I think of that question, of course, is our migratory shorebirds. So um, our plovers and sandpipers. These birds don't nest in New York City. They migrate through and they stop over here. And when they stop over here, they need to refuel and they need to rest so that they can continue their migration. Um, these birds actually migrate between South America and the Arctic. So they're flying incredibly long distances. And when they stop here, they really need to be able to rest. So by giving these birds their space, um, by protecting their habitats and making sure they have high quality habitat to stop over in, we can also um, help protect those birds, which are having very large population declines across their range as well. Thank you. And how have you, how long have you been working on the Black Skimmer project and how successful has it been? And it's been ongoing for this person. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. Um, I started working on the Black Skimmer project in 2017. I believe that that project was ongoing for several years before I came on board. Um, black skimmers, like the other beach nesting birds, are still not doing very well in New York City, um, and the colonies are continuing to get smaller and consolidate into one. Um, we submitted comments to the DEC petitioning them to list black skimmers as endangered species in New York State, which would afford them extra protections. So that's an, an ongoing battle that we're sort of fighting and, and trying to figure out how we can continue to, to help protect these birds. And one more for Caitlin. Um, any observations of the Rosiat terns interest, um, interested in nesting in your common tern colonies? None that I know of, um, unless these birds come in and maybe check things out when we're not around and then move on. Um, so far, we, we've not had any roseate terns in the colonies that we monitor um, and work with, which are mainly um, the mainland colonies on the Rockaway Peninsula. And so um, bringing it back to uh, Decoy through the lens of, of being an art form, a historic art form, um, any big makers or distributors of wildfowl decoys like this present day, is it, cons is it considered an art form? Can you speak to that, Amy? It is absolutely still considered an art form. There are carvers guilds, there are annual festivals for carvers and for collectors. And if you're interested in collecting or if you have like an object that you want kind of um, evaluated or you want to learn more about, uh, there are regional collectors associations. So you can really just do an inter internet search that has like your, you know, your region you're in, like Northeast, Long Island, New York, and then uh, type it with Decoy Collectors Association. Um, and there's a lot of forums. There's also a magazine that's specific to decoys called Decoy Magazine that will have a lot of information about this. It's uh, published by monthly and it covers everything from master decoy makers to contemporary craftsmen. Um, and hunters uh, uh, primarily use kind of a factory decoys now. So these uh, epoxy or plastic decoys. Um, but a lot of uh, carvers uh, do make these just for primarily decorative, uh, decorative purposes. And um, our, so one of the questions was about rare uh, types of decoys. Um, any coveted species or artists? Can you speak to that, Amy? Um, 
Yeah, so with coveted species, it'll be uh, the most of the shorebirds, uh, especially the curlews. The Eskimo curlew was uh, one of the first to go extinct, and it was one of the first to be protected. So an Eskimo curlew decoy is probably the rarest. Um, and decoy collecting, this is also going to answer another question that's in the chat, but decoy collecting didn't really take off um, until after the turn of the century. The term decoy collecting was kind of coined in 1900. Um, so by the time folks started collecting decoys and it really took off as its own market was more in like the 60s and 70s. So by this time, like a lot of those those older shorebirds had, as I said, either like been, you know, used for fuel or discarded. So a lot of the, the, the early shorebirds are the rarest. Thank you. And there is a question about who at the museum to contact um, with additional questions or information to contribute to the project. Um, you know, I think um, just if you will have the education um, email address um, as a registrant of this program, feel free to send information to the education at folkartmuseum.org and I will get it to our collections team. Um, so yes, if anyone would like to contribute in that way, please feel free to use that email. Um, and Amy and Caitlin, um, are you seeing other questions that um, feel like burning questions to you that you'd love to address? Um, I saw that Elizabeth added that owls and crows are used to repel pigeons and other birds from the garden. And that goes, um, Amy's last slide was an owl decoy or a cartoony owl decoy. Uh, I believe that was used. Um, and do we know of any other birds that are used in that way? Um, it's interesting. Uh, you'll often hear again, paired with audio, um, owls sitting out on piers or on boats or on rooftops, um, often paired with like a screeching um, of a red-tailed hawk or another predator species. I will say for the most part, these don't work. Um, they will maybe work for a minute or two, um, but just like birds don't realize that decoys or realize that decoys of their own species aren't necessarily real birds fairly quickly. And that's why we have to use audio and mirrors and, and other things. Um, birds will maybe be a little scared at first and then quickly become habituated and quickly realize that that owl is not a real owl. Um, so unfortunately, those are not long-term pest control solutions. And so many questions about plovers. So this final question that just came in, um, curious, the early decoys of plovers, were they used for hunting or as an art form? If for hunting, were the plovers eaten or was it just for sport? Can you say that again? Sorry. Yes, the early decoy, the early plover decoys, were they used for hunting or as art? And if for hunting, um, were they eaten or for sport? They were eaten. Yeah, everything, pretty much every species uh, was eaten. Uh, plovers, black lily plovers, uh, even though they're small, um, they made apparently a great soup. I'm a vegetarian, so I cannot attest to that. Uh, but yeah, all the species you see represented uh, were eaten, which is kind of weird about mergansers and scoters. Uh, you don't, a lot of people don't eat those now because they have a very fishy taste. But um, at the time, you know, when the colonies uh, were growing, you know, uh, food sources that was, you know, they really needed to, to supplement their food reserves and their agriculture with with game. I will also note that some of those species are still eaten in the Caribbean and in South America. Um, which can sometimes pose a challenge for conservationists. So we can do, um, you know, we can outlaw hunting of species in decline. We can do all of these conservation efforts. We can create new colonies for them. We can support them. Um, but a lot of these birds have life cycles that span multiple countries, right? Because they're going from South and Central America through North America during migration and then up into the Canadian Arctic to breed. And so all conservation strategies have to take into account the full annual life cycle of these birds. And that's why um, cross-country coordination along the entire um, you know, migration and breeding and wintering grounds for these birds is really important for conservation work if we're actually going to have impact. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, well, I think we will 
end it here unless either you, Caitlin, or um, Amy have, have more to add. Um, I want to thank everyone on the call for your great questions and to both of our speakers, your generous and fascinating insights. Um, we hope you'll be inspired to follow the work of New York City Audubon. And please also consider joining us online and in person for future programs. Um, if you enjoyed tonight's conversation, know that you can always donate to support educational programming here at AFAM. It helps us continue offering these talks. Um, thank you everyone so much and take care.